Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. James Lyons-Weiler, coming to you live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, from the WWDNYK Studios. WWDNYK stands for What We Do Not Yet Know Studios. Um, today, I have the distinct honor of offering you a tribute on Breaking Science episode on some unfinished work that Dr. Tony Bark and I were working on at the time of her untimely, unwelcome uh, passing. Um, Dr. Bark was a professional uh, colleague of mine. She is also a personal friend of mine. She is a friend to everyone who knew her. And so I would like to offer this as my tribute to Dr. Tony Bark. The best way that I remember her was her, her vicious bulldog-like adherence to the truth. Her, She would not let go of an issue if she thought that there was a wrong in this world. She stayed focused on the most pressing points in any discussion. And I have had the honor of working with her on some cases in the NVICP through Patty Finn's office. And I am going to present some information today in honor of Dr. Bark, that she and I had worked on together, and I have finished it off. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about the origins of this topic. Today's on Breaking Science, we're going to focus on asthma. Asthma is an autoimmune disease. And we're going to focus on the consequences of this. Tony knew it was an autoimmune disease. She knew it was an autoimmune disease. I knew it was an autoimmune disease. It's time to bring the science forward. So I look at <clears throat> asthma classically. The medical community, allopathic medical community, looks at, first and foremost, environment and inflammation. There's some trigger out there that causes something to go on. It's like an allergy. Um, they speak of immunoglobulin E, they speak about a person being hypersensitive, they speak about genetics, and they speak about this strange thing called atopy. All of this involves the individual and the environment, which is fine. It's important. Individual differences are important. The environment's important. But they always seem to leave out some critical parts of the environment, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. Um, in the classical view of asthma as an allergic response, it's seen as an event that's triggered by environmental exposure. So there's some environmental exposure that an individual is, is uh, experienced, and that event triggers something within the body, within the um, airways, within the lungs. Um, I personally was uh, diagnosed with allergy-induced asthma. Uh, and the medical community loves to talk about allergy when it comes to asthma. Uh, they speak about airway allergic hypersensitivity. Um, they look at the IgE immune response, and they speak about atopy, which is a strange concept to begin with. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of that, down to the molecule here. Um, Th1 mediated response um, is opposed to a Th2. These are T helper cells. It's classically seen as atopy, whereas Th2 typifies autoimmunity. Um, the current conditions, concurrent conditions that can, these are the comorbid so called conditions, but like eczema, urticaria, and Hashimoto's disease, are, they're considered comorbid, and many of those are also considered atopy. And um, there's never any consideration for common root causes among those comorbid conditions. If a person has eczema and they also have asthma, they're seen as two distinct things that happen to be happening to the same person, whether or not they share a common root cause. Maybe that there's some genetics, but that's about it. So um, there's two documents that the medical community has referenced repeatedly. Um, about this, we're going to go over the Global Initiative for Asthma. It's funny, it says copyrighted material. It's cited by Wikipedia, although the link to the original document is now broken, of course. It's a 404. 
Um, but this was published in 2011, and this gives us kind of classical view about why we think the way that we think now, why many people in the medical community think the way they think now. And the key points here that I pulled out, listen to this description of how they describe asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder. Chronic, yes, inflammatory disorder, inflammation. This strange inflammation that happens to be occurring um, of the airways in which many cells and cellular components play a role. Very non-specific, non-committal. The chronic inflammation is associated with air, airway hyper-responsiveness. Okay, hyper-responsiveness, of course, to an environmental trigger, apparently, that leads to recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, test chitness, and coughing, particularly at night and in the morning. These episodes are usually associated with widespread but variable airflow obstruction. Okay, yada, yada, within the lung, there's often reversible, either spontaneously or with treatment. Um, I can't emphasize for you enough what's missing from this description. It's a passive-aggressive description of what we now see, many in increasing numbers see as a clear autoimmune condition. But we'll get to the good stuff later. Um, it, it's embedded in this paradigm, uh, in their figure, factors influencing the development and expression of asthma, host factors, host factors. So a person with asthma is a host. This again implies that there's something from the external coming into the internal. It's very, very subtle. But their genetic predisposing to atopy, predisposing to airway hyper, hyper responsiveness, and um, obesity and gender. Environmental factors, they list all of these environmental factors, allergens, domestic mites, furred animals, cockroach allergens, fungi, mold, yeasts. I mean, those are just the indoor and the outdoor pollen, fungi, molds, yeast. Um, by fungi, I think they mean spores, and <laughs> of course, mold spores. Um, <clears throat> infections, predominantly viral. Okay, I buy that a little bit. Occupational sensitizers, these are chemicals. And then, of course, things like tobacco smoke, active and passive smoking, outdoor and indoor air pollution, and diet. Of course, those things can exacerbate asthma. Um, but as we'll see, all of these environmental factors are antigens. They call them allergens, but they're actually antigens. And we'll see why that's an important distinction. Another report about the same time period um, from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Asthma Education Prevention Program, Expert Panel Report 3, Guidelines and for the Diagnosis and Management of Asthma, 2007. My main reason for bringing this out again is to say, all right, look at the pathophysiology. This is just this from the table of contents. We don't have to go into it in depth, but the pathophysiology and pathogenesis of asthma, they focus on inflammatory cells, inflammatory mediators, immunoglobulin, implications for uh, therapy, immunoglobulin being IgE as opposed to IgG. The pathogenesis, again, a host factors. Patient, the patient has a factor. Not that I don't understand this host factor unless they think viruses are involved in every case. Environmental factors, <clears throat> and so on. So the, the focus here is starkly different from what I'm about to show you as we have moved forward in science since then. But um, if we look at their understanding of the factors limiting an airflow and how we get there, you'll see that they have environmental factors here. That's a big one. Look at the big red lightning bolt. And apparently, the, the environmental factors um, excite a dendritic cell. A dendritic cell is a, an immune cell. And then we get into the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes, IgE, and then the cytokines, IL-3, 4, 13, and 9, and IL-3 and 5, and uh, GMC. Uh, CSF, <clears throat> you'll notice that there's induction of both mast cell response and eosinophil response and neutrophil response. Wow. 
all from one environmental factor. That's some amazingly powerful environmental factor. Um, they do note that there's both Th2 type and Th1 cytokines. However, the predominant response that they're going to want us to focus on and have been wanting people to focus on um, is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Th1. Again, it, again, with the environmental factors and inflammatory products. Inflammatory products, we could be do a little bit better than that. We'll see why in a minute. But the different layers of the cell, of the mucosal layer and the basal layer, you see cellular differences and the smooth layer of the airway, okay? You see changes, but they're not very specific at this time. Uh, but you do see persistent inflammation and development of remodeling. I don't know why they say development of remodeling. They should say remodeling, and remodeling is going to turn out to be very important in this too. Uh, and that induces in their model here pro-inflammatory mediators, and so you have kind of a runaway positive feedback loop. Everything's nice and tight in a circle, and never, ever, ever, ever do you see autoimmunity here. Interesting, okay? So this is their model of an allergic response. <clears throat> So Tony and I thought it would be a good idea to fine tune our understanding of this a little bit. And in our refined view, we have brought forward the realization that allergies do not lead to self tissue damage. That's what remodeling is. Asthma leads to cellular matrix restructuring. Asthma leads to the induction of a wound response, a wound response. That's not doesn't sound like what an allergy would do. An allergy would make you sneeze because you have an allergic reaction to it. An allergy would induce, you know, um, a rush of uh, a, a massive histamine reaction with a positive feedback loop. An allergy would induce things like that, but. How we get to matrix remodeling, uh, cellular matrix remodeling? Well, if we look at this study by Samitas et al., the upper and lower airway remodeling mechanisms in asthma, allergic rhinitis, and chronic rhinosinusitis, the one airway concept revisited. This is Samitas et al., 2017. They described the airway remodeling as, quote, tissue restructuring. I'm sorry, I've got to advance the slide. Tissue re structural changes that occur in a disease setting and reflect the dynamic process of tissue restructuring during wound repair. They also write that airway remodeling is well recognized as a hallmark feature of the asthmatic lung that is often associated with more severe phenotypes of disease. Now, pay attention to the, the less severe initial onset, later more severe big changes there like eosinophilia. We're going to get into that. They list among the types of tissue remodeling in the lower airways include epithelial shedding, shedding goblet cell hyperplasia, uh, basement uh, membrane thickening, muc mucus gland airway smooth muscle cell hypertrophy, subepithelial fibrosis and increased vascularization or angiogenesis, which is related to, again, the severity of the disease. So, um, they show that between allergic rhinitis, which is mild, and the epithelium, the basement membrane, the submucosis, it seems pretty normal. If you have an allergic response, you can get allergic rhinitis, hay fever. With uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, um, then you start seeing these big differences, the disrupted shedding, uh, excess goblet cells activated state, the thickening of the basement membrane, submucosal, you get uh, mucus gland hypertrophy, pseudocyst formation, and so on. Um, you, you end up seeing cellular turnover. And in allergic asthma, unfortunately, they're still kind of stuck in the, <laughs> the mindset of allergic asthma, disrupted shedding, excess goblet cells, activated state, and so on, Thick, thickened um, basement membrane, uh, mucus gland hypertrophy in the submucosa and the cellular turnover, increased angiogenesis, and um, the airway smooth mem uh, muscle hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Well, how do you get, if you're coughing all the time, why do your smooth muscles go away? Interesting. 
What would make a smooth muscle cell go away? It's our contention, or my contention, that the extensive tissue remodeling seen in asthma cannot be achieved merely via allergy. Uh, Sumitas reported that cytokines, such as osteopontin, are noted in the intracellular signaling of asthmatics, including IL-6 and IL-8 in the airway smooth muscle cells. What do we know about cytokines? We know cytokines are signaling molecules that the um, immune system is uh, intricately involved in, including the innate and the adaptive immune system. Now, this is our words, not Semitas at all, but again, the extensive tissue remodeling seen in asthma can't be achieved merely by allergy. The, the Semitas at all say that enhanced vascularity correlates with asthma severity. The worse your asthma is, the more likely it is that you have vascularity. This is uh, increased, including increased angiogenesis. And it's a key feature of people who died from asthma. Changes to the airway vasculature include increased numbers of vessels per unit area with enhanced vessel size and associated vasodilation and leakage, leading to mucosal edema. Increased vascularity is present even in mild asymptomatic asthma. So <clears throat> that last statement there is like a hook to keep us on the uh, allergy uh, bent. But... Asthma, turns out, second layer level of evidence, yields autoantibody profiles. So the fact that we see tissue restructuring alone is not enough to say asthma is autoimmunity. But since asthma yields autoantibody profiles, that's a problem. And I chose a couple of, there are many studies like this, but the one in 2019, sputum autoantibodies to self-antigens such as eosinophil peroxidase in asthmatics by Quinn et al. I suppose that would be pronounced Keen et al. Uh, autoantibody profiles and their association with blood eosinophils and asthma and COPD. That's a comparison. We're going to get into that. In this uh, Keen et al., they characterize the sputum autoantibodies in asthma patients, and they found that many autoantibodies, some of which are even, even some which are accepted as hallmarks of autoimmunity, such as antithyroid peroxidase, as is seen in autoimmune thyroiditis, those are increased in asthmatics. So why would an autoantibody characteristic of an autoimmune disease be found in asthmatics? A higher enough percentage to be noted as one of the main types that are found in the sputum. So they wrote, patients with severe eosinophilic asthma have detectable IgG antibodies. Okay. Um, against eosinophil peroxidase and other autologous cellular components, such as double-stranded DNA, histones, and so forth, collectively named anti-nuclear antibodies, the ANAs anti-nuclear antibody autoimmunity that doesn't sound like an allergy to me all of a sudden and these are in the sputum these antibodies are present in much lower titers in the serum suggesting the presence of an in situ mechanism in the airway that promotes auto antibody generation interesting well the immune system as we know is everywhere but we'll get we'll look at the eosinophils and they, they're trying to say that it's only um, eosinophils that are produced in the lung. We'll see, see about that. Uh, so here's the data, what they found. They, they looked at uh, 50 stable asthmatic patients and 24 healthy volunteers. They were recruited into the study. 15 had mild asthma, 18 had moderate asthma, and 17 with severe asthma. The concentration of sputum autoantibodies against U1 small nuclear ribonucleoprotein sputum antibody against Smith antigen and the serum antibody against thyroid peroxidase, anti-TPO. Oh, that's serum antibody of thyroid peroxidase in severe asthmatic and sputum anti-U1 SNRNP in moderate asthmatics were significantly higher. Serum thyroid anti-peroxidase autoantibody. Now, this is a cool network diagram where they showed this is a correlation matrix, okay? These are some real kind of like clinical features of 
the, the disease. They cluster. These patients tend to cluster, and, and, and there's a correlation. Red, high red being a positive correlation, and uh, uh, I guess that's going green. I'm a bit colorblind today, but uh, negative being green, uh, being a negative correlation. What we see is that there's many auto um, antibodies, multiple auto antibodies per patient. And um, those are the numbers. And then, you know, they're, they're, they're co-occurrence. And, and that's a pretty cool analysis. Okay, so um, this, this points to a host of auto antibody response with a heterogeneous distribution among the clinical population. The next study um, that I pulled out as an example is Tamai et al. 2016. They found anti-nuclear antibody titers of greater than 1 to 160 presented only in asthma. They studied six autoantibody types in 110 asthma patients and 92 COPD patients. The ANA and anti-cytoplasmic antibodies, uh, RF, Factor, the um, anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide antibody and the myeloperoxidase anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibody um, and proteinase 3 anti-neutrophil autoantibodies were studied. Their findings uh, of an anti-nuclear antibody titer of greater than 1 to 160 in asthma, it was 10%, but not in COPD, was significant, highly so. And in keeping with asthma being an autoimmune condition, the eosinophil counts in the blood were negative predictors of ANAs and asthma. What does that mean? Well, the eosinophil counts in the blood did not correlate with the ANAs. That means that we have a in situ uh, production of eosinophils. But as eosinophils tend to go, we'll see later that they are also produced in the bone, and that's important. In keeping with COPD not being an autoimmune condition, they found that eosinophil counts in blood and immunoglobulin E of greater than 100 international units per milliliter were positively associated with rheumatoid factor Okay, in asthma, but not in COPD. So here we have Tissue remodeling, tissue restructuring that's not expected from a simple little allergy. We have asthma yielding strongly autoantibody profiles. We also have reports that I'm not going to great detail, but I will provide the references that asthma severity is in fact related to the severity of autoimmune antibodies. The severity of a condition being correlated with a potential causal factor is one of the criteria for causality. And there's two references that were already available in 2007, 2008, uh, when those previous reports were being written. Autosensitization. Look at the way they turn this language around. Autosensitization as a pathomechanism in asthma. Asthma and autoimmunity, a complex but intriguing relation. Okay, so the autosensitization idea is, hang on, I went once too quickly. Patients suffering from severe chronic atopic diseases have also shown to develop autoreactive antibodies. This is 2007. So how come in those uh, reports, the expert panel reports, they didn't mention this? Autoreactive antibodies and vice versa, autoreactive IgE antibodies may contribute to the perpetuation of allergic immune responses. Why didn't they say that? All right. They, um, they're talking about allergic sensitization, subsequent aerosol challenge in mice to a potential autoantigen leads to allergic. Uh, why can't they say autoimmune? They're right there, everywhere it says, leads to an allergic. They should say it leads to an autoimmune airway inflammation and chronic exposure to sensitized mice to a foreign allergen induces autoreactive antibodies. Why? Okay, let's, let, let's take a look at this. Autoreactive immune mechanisms, just say autoimmune condition, may be induced either through molecular mimicry, autoimmunity, 
or as a consequence of chronic al allergic inflammatory processes. And these reactivities may then possibly contribute to the perpetuation of <clears throat> allergic, they mean autoimmune, uh, responses even in the absence of exogenous allergens. Perpetuation of allergic immune responses even in the absence of exogenous allergens. The logic that's twisted here is, is remarkable uh, in the development of autoimmune disease. How do you have an allergic response to something that's an allergen in the absence of the allergen? Because you're having a, quote, allergic response to your own proteins that's called autoimmunity. So we're, we're not going to be... Um, referencing to allergens much anymore, but uh, Tedeschi et al., this is now 2008, they found that, um, look at this, asthma and autoimmune diseases apparently have little to share, except for the involvement of the immune system. Mm -hmm. However, epidemiologic study shows that asthma and type 1 diabetes, a typical autoimmune disease, are associated at the population level. There's that comorbidity. Um, recent findings in experimental animals provide involvement in an autoreactive mechanism. There's that word again, that phrase, autoreactive mechanism. Why? Just call it an autoimmune mechanism in asthma as well, indicating that human alpha nascent polypeptide associated complex identified as an IgE reactive autoantigen has the potential to sensitize and induce immediate skin reactions and airway inflammation. So there's other conditions that are atopic, like urticaria, that um, are definitely um, autoimmune conditions. In summary, asthma is a heterogeneous disorder, I'll agree with that, characterized by chronic inflammation of the respiratory airways, fine, that can be triggered by allergen exposure or by other mechanisms, possibly autoreactive slash autoimmune. So by 2008, they were already saying possibly autoimmune. Those other reports didn't mention autoimmunity at all. The autoimmune hypothesis further is further indirectly supported by response to immunosuppressive drugs. Whoa, 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 whoa. You mean a treatment that's effective against autoimmune conditions works against a condition? Doesn't that mean that that's an autoimmune condition? So we already talked about the correlations exist between levels of autoimmune antibodies and asthma severity. But these are the two references that said that. Okay. So what about this response to autoimmune treatment? Case studies. There are case studies of response to autoimmune treatment. There's three patients with asthma in this um, that write up that uh, responded to therapy directed against autoimmune disease. Um, in this particular Spencer et al., um, they, they demonstrated... Uh, definite changes in the health outcome after uh, interventions. Um, other interventions didn't seem to work. So the failure of aggressive therapy, a joint decision was made to start 800 milligrams per 160 milligrams of all right, so they they had they, they, their their auto their standard therapy didn't work for these people with asthma, and um, they ended up uh, doing better when they treated them as if they had an autoimmune condition. Airway eosinophilopoietic and autoimmune mechanisms of eosinophilia and severe asthma. This is a major major sea change here. Um, we have persistent eosinophils, okay? And this, people are starting to talk about this in um, a manner that's more consistent with autoimmunity, 2018, especially when it's severe. As a, as a, as a, and this is a bala at all. As asthma becomes more severe, in addition to the classic type 2 inflammatory cascade meeting and process of eosinophil recruitment into the lung, additional processes such as in situ eosinophilopoiesis and lung compartmental, compartmentalized autoimmune responses, there it is, 2018, may contribute to the persistence of airway eosinophilia. 
There it is. I get all excited and then may contribute. Uh, how about appears to contribute? But in some of the details here, and these are important, they have local and systematic factors contributing to airway eosinophilia. Um, if we look at the what they call allergens, and then you get your cytokines here, um, that's going to influence what's happening in the blood. That's where eosinophilia takes place. That's where the production of eosinophils takes place. And then they recruit back to the lung. And some pretty clever experiments have been done where, you know, you, you, you infect just or you expose just one lung to these so-called allergens. And uh, through a systemic response, you see inflammation in both lungs. And so uh, they talk about the drug treatments and so on. But you see the, the, the cytokine signaling that's here. The, the, the mature eosinophils after they go after they're produced in the bone that's systemic okay that's systemic and there's a systemic eosinophilia that happens here um, and that's further evidence that it's autoimmune it's not just a localized allergic response <clears throat> so the great IgE myth was that IgE is not really involved as much in autoimmunity and that it's more IgG that should be we should be looking for and yet here we see two major reviews so all these atopic conditions that have IgE responses um, there's a major major autoimmune component here people and um, that's kind of the, the, the you know nail in the coffin right there uh, they can't hide behind that well how about this in some per people's views, there's no difference between allergy and autoimmunity. So some authors of academic books underline a clear border between allergy and autoimmunity. The typical pathologic pictures would not suggest a similar similarity in pathogenesis of allergic or autoimmune disorders. And yet, so, you know, the TH2 rhinoconjunctivitis or asthma, okay, that's T helper 2. That depends on the severity of the disease. Lymphocytes, Th2 derived cytokines as interleukins. You know, an infection response tends to give a balanced Th1, Th2 response as opposed to a Th2 loaded response, right? Um, on the contrary, putative autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis or type 1 diabetes myelitis are thought to be mediated by T helper type 1 lymphocytes. But the most popular simplified hypothesis of a Th1, Th2 imbalance attempts to explain it. <laughs> I guess that would be idiopathology of certain diseases. Um, however, in recent years, findings of some studies have just suggested that there is no clear dichotomy between allergy and autoimmunity. Both of them result from dysregulation of the immune system. Dysregulation of the immune system. In recent years, interest of investigators is focused on the key elements that regulate the immune response in many allergic and autoimmune diseases, mast cells, autoantibodies, T cells, cytokines, and genetic determinants. In other words, you can have an environmental trigger, you can have genetic determinants, you can have inflammation, you can have all of this, and it can still be autoimmunity. Okay. So, so let's look at some asthma statistics. This comes from WebMD. Every day in America, 40,000 people miss school or work due to asthma. 30,000 people have an asthma attack. 5,000 people visit the emergency room to, to asthma. That's every day. 1,000 people are admitted to the hospital due to asthma. 11 people per day die from asthma. <clears throat> 77 a week. 77 a week. Um... Among children ages 5 to 17, asthma is the leading cause of school absences from a chronic illness. It accounts for an annual loss of more than 14 million school days per year, approximately eight days for each student with asthma, and more hospitalizations than any other childhood disease. It is estimated that children with asthma spend nearly 8 million days per year restricted to bed. That's a lot. How about mortality from asthma? <clears throat> If every day 11 Americans die from asthma, then there are more than 4,000 deaths due to asthma every year. 4,000. 
and many of which are avoidable with proper treatment and care. <coughs> They're also avoidable if you don't cause asthma in the first place. In addition, asthma is indicated as a contributing factor for near, nearly 7,000 other deaths. So it's a complicating factor in 7,000 other deaths. Now, this is going to sound familiar to a lot of people. Since 1980, asthma death rates overall have increased more than 50% among all genders, age groups, and ethnic groups. The death rate for children under 19 years has increased by nearly 80% since 1980. More females die from asthma than males, and women account for nearly the 60% of asthma deaths overall. African Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma. To many people in my community, that's not going to be a surprise. African American women have the highest asthma mortality rate of all groups, more than 2.5 times higher than Caucasian women. And right there, people are going to say, those are smoking differences. Those are smoking differences. Well, maybe so. But smoking differences plus what? What's the missing component? When we look at morbidity, asthma accounts for a quarter of all emergency room visit, visits per U.S. per year with and 2 million emergency room visits every year. Every year, asthma accounts for more than 10 million outpatient visits and 500,000 hospitalizations. The average length of stay for asthma hospitalizations is three days. Nearly half of all asthma hospitalizations are for children. Asthma is the third ranking cause of hospitalization in children. Asthma is the number one cause of school absenteeism and so on, 14 million total missed days. And African Americans are three times more likely to be hospitalized. Social and economic costs. The social, uh, the uh, the uh, annual cost of asthma is estimated to be nearly eighteen billion dollars. That's just one condition. Direct costs accounted for nearly ten billion, with hospitalizations the single largest portion, and indirect costs of eight billions. Those are lost earnings and illness due to illness or death. For adults, asthma is the fourth leading cause of work absenteeism and presenteeism, in, <laughs> resulting in nearly 15 million missed or lost less productive work days each year. This accounts for nearly 3 billion of the indirect costs shown as above. My allergy-induced asthma was so bad. I had it for a year before they could diagnose me with anything, and um, I, I was incapable of doing anything except for coughing and trying to get it under control. Well, why don't we look at some animal models of autoimmunity while we're at it? Since I believe, and we all should believe, and understand, I should say, I understand asthma to be an autoimmune condition. I don't like the term belief, and I don't like the term proof. Belief is for faith, and proof is for math, and um, whiskey, and logic. But let's look at animal models of autoimmunity, including the use of aluminum hydroxide. So when you want to induce autoimmune conditions in mice so that you can develop a drug to treat that autoimmune condition, you take some aluminum hydroxide and you inject it, and then you expose the animal to an antigen. With the antigen alone, the animal's not going to necessarily develop an autoimmune condition. With the aluminum hydroxide alone, the animal's not necessarily going to uh, um induce or develop the autoimmune condition but it's the combination of the two um, there's probably a good reason why nothing about asthma talks about aluminum but I'm going to show you a list of autoimmune conditions that can be induced using either aluminum hydroxide or um, in combination with a, an antigen source um, or in one special case, aluminum hydroxide all on its own without any antigen source. Allergic rhinitis, arthritis, atherosclerosis, antiphospholipid syndrome, asthma, food allergies, gastrointestinal allergies, glomulonephritis, autoimmune condition of kidneys, lupus, Sjorgen syndrome. That's an autoimmune condition of the tear ducts. And the table that I put together from a deep dive into the literature. Um, I list the autoimmune disease, the aluminum type, and the symptoms of the manifestation, and then the citation. And there's the allergic asthma right up at top. There's two studies that when this table is put together, there's probably more. Allergic rhinitis, bronchiolar asthma, APS, arthritis, 
I just noticed I'm missing a reference in that, but atherosclerosis of all things. Um, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, gastrointestinal allergy, preceding asthma. Now that one used aluminum potassium phosphate. Systemic lupus, erythromatosis. Motor neuron disease, Schwergen syndrome and food allergy. Using aluminum hydroxide. Now, one of the criticisms that I received when I first started talking about, you know, every time that we have an autoimmune condition, we want to develop a new drug or see if steroid injections work or whatever the hell we're going to try to do to these poor kids because they have autoimmune disorders. All right. We tested out on mice first. And the criticism of my observation, my reporting that hey, wait a minute, the scientific community induces autoimmunity. And some of these papers um, boasted that they could induce autoimmunity on a routine and reproducible manner. All right. Um, they introduced the aluminum hydroxide and an antigen source, okay, for all these conditions. So going through the table again this time, but looking at the antigen source. Um, <clears throat> You can get arthritis by collagen in the presence of aluminum hydroxide. All right, that's one example. Um, you can induce, there's another example here, food allergies with uh, peanut, pea, apple, ovalbumin. Many of these conditions use ovalbumin as the antigen source. Interesting, uh, if, if, in asthma, the ovalbumin is present in vaccines. And um, the criticism that I've received is that these autoimmune conditions, um, they might use, you know, I'm told, I was told, between 10,000 to 20,000 times the dose of aluminum that, wow. that's used in a vaccine that a kid might typically see. So I checked. I did the math. I did what a scientist does. I went and I tested the idea by going to these studies, looking at the body weight of the mouse, the dose given for the aluminum, and um, it takes re most of the time it takes repeated exposures. Asthma was induced by sensitization with ovalbumin and aluminum hydroxide on day one, seven, and seven, fourteen. So there's multiple rounds of exposure, not unlike a vaccine schedule, right? Um, but, uh, I, I looked and I don't have the table here, but, um, or the chart, but the, and the genetic susceptibility, um, in mice only required five times the, uh, the dose or 11 times the dose or 17 times the dose, not 10,000 to 20,000 times the dose. And that's just one vaccine. There's 72 vaccines on the CDC schedule. Okay. 60% of them contain aluminum hydroxide. So if we can re reproducibly and reliably induce autoimmunity, okay, um, asthma, I think was uh, the lowest was 51, but allergic rhinitis was 17. But if we can in, in mouse models that have a genetic susceptibility to the outcome, <coughs> it <coughs> induce, <coughs> excuse me, autoimmunity, including asthma, using doses that are within range of the schedule, because a child on the CDC schedule experiences the whole schedule, not just one vaccine, then it would make sense for us to say that aluminum hydroxide plus ovalbumin in humans will cause asthma in the presence of um, antigens. It turns out that there was one study, not this study, but there was one study that found that they could induce asthma in mice just by injecting them with aluminum hydroxide, that the ambient exposure to um, amb ambient antigens was enough, whatever was in the cage, whatever was in the room. So let's get back to root causes here. The, this, the, mystery, the mystery of the eosinophils. The focus is on localized um, production in the lung of eosinophilia, as if somehow that would make it not autoimmune. Um, 
the systemic production of eosinophilia is thought to involve the bone. And we've already seen in the, the, the Bala et al. review that we know that eosinophils that make it to the lung come from the bone. Um, this Chu and Barek study in immunology found that um, the injection of alum adjuvant plus antigen induced a lasting activation of eosinophils. Not, not a surprise there, but after 60 days, these activated eosinophils still produced elevated levels of cytokine without further injection of aluminum. So we're off to the races. If you do it enough times, okay, if you do it, combine, combine the adjuvant and the antigen. Um, you know, Dr. Bark and I, Tony and I, we would talk about these things from time to time. We didn't talk about them nearly enough because we were both so busy on everything else we were talking about. But I do want to give a shout out to Todd Terhune and Richard Deeth, who published this uh, aluminum containing vaccine uh, in the context of the hygiene hypothesis, a risk factor for eosinophilia and allergy um, in a genetically susceptible population. Uh, you know, th this is a great paper, but I would really like to see more of a focus on um, autoimmunity by, by these by these two. Um, it's, it's important that we move beyond uh, being medically correct, which is my new term for the same thing as as politically correct. OK, we really don't need to kowtow to the medical community. I'm not saying that Terhun and Deeth did that, but I'm speaking to any researcher who's interested in asthma. Um, there are um, other references that uh, <clears throat> I'd like to to point people to, but <clears throat> excuse me, just take a look at um, take a look at some of the reviews um, where it, it's really clear that some part of the medical community and the scientific community wants to move asthma into uh, an autoimmune condition of the airways all right airway autoimmune inflammatory response syndrome um, it's it's really important that we take a good look at, uh, at at people that are saying that this is a general autoimmune condition of the airways and that other things okay um, other things, uh, it's it's more than just overlap. It's it's part of it. In the early, you know, conditions, in the early stages of asthma, it's not as severe. In the later stages of asthma, it gets more severe, and that's where you get your eosinophilia. And what I want to say is that, um, you, you know, we, we should not look at it as heterogeneous, as if we don't have a compass on the development of asthma, saying that it, well, it's autoimmune only in the most severe cases. To try to save asthma in general as being some kind of an allergy, um, it's a little, like saying you have a little bit of cancer. You either have autoimmunity or you don't. Now, you may be developing it between the second and third shot, okay, with... <laughs> but you're underway. But then once you have it, as we progress and our immune system becomes, you know, exposed to antigens by breathing them in, we understand food antigens. We call them food antigens if we eat them. Why do we call them allergens if we breathe them or if, we, if they're, we're exposed on our skin? They're antigens. The antigen, use of the term antigen allows us then to say, oh, wait a minute, bio, bio, um, molecular mimicry, Okay, other mechanisms of autoimmunity. This is probably an autoimmune condition. It changes everything. Um, so what are the recommendations going forward? Um, I would recommend, first and foremost, by far the, the most important thing that I think that we can do is um, get the aluminum out of the vaccines. Uh, my research at IPAC uh, alone and with... Uh, um, collaborators has consistently shown that the dosing of aluminum in vaccines is much higher than we thought that it should be if we given given our attempt to estimate uh, and produce and publish and we did publish a pediatric dose limit 
The FDA has never published a pediatric dose limit. The, F the US FDA does not know what a safe level of aluminum is. Um, and I think if you want to participate in this, you can call the FDA. Give them a call and ask them what a safe pediatric dose of aluminum is per body weight in a vaccine. And if hundreds of people start calling and thousands of people start calling, then maybe they'll get the clue. And tell them when they write to you, which they should do, ask for a response in writing, um, tell them about, write back to them and tell them about the research that we've done that shows that in children on the CDC schedule, it appears that they're 70% of their days, they're in aluminum toxicity uh, in the first seven months of life. That's my estimate. That's an estimate of my, me and my colleagues, including Dr. Paul Thomas. Um, but also tell them that in the first two years of life, kids are expected to be in aluminum toxicity beyond our pediatric dose limit, one out of four days. Um, that paper is published in the Journal of Trace Elements in Medicine and Biology. And um, in that paper, we compared uh the through compared three schedules mcfarland at all compared three schedules um the cdc schedule dr paul thomas's vaccine friendly plan and an intermediate schedule that just excluded um you know swapped out aluminum containing vaccines for non-aluminum containing vaccines and our papers under attack somebody wrote to the journal not surprisingly and accused us of trying to advertise Paul's schedule. And I wrote a rebuttal. We wrote a rebuttal back. And, uh, you know, that paper is no more of an advertisement for one schedule than it is for another, for them, than it is for the CDC schedule. We happened to mention Paul Thomas's schedule because that's one that we were most familiar with. And it was also one that we knew would have lower aluminum content. Now you can see the importance of keeping aluminum out of your diet, um, aluminum out of your vaccines, aluminum out of your body. Um, there are many, many other things that go wrong that other than asthma. There are many autoimmune conditions other than asthma, as you saw. So we're, we have a plague of autoimmunity right now. I think it's over 54% of children have uh, chronic illness for which they'll need pharmaceutical drugs for the rest of their lives, allegedly. But I think it's time that we get active and that we tell our senators and congressmen that the NIH should start funding ways of getting aluminum out of children and out of adults. We know from um, Chris Exley's work that there are many conditions in which aluminum is found in the brain, like autism and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the list goes on and on and on. Aluminum does not belong in our bodies. Now, McFarland et al. also published an appendix that showed that the claim that there's more aluminum in water and food than you'll ever see from a vaccine. And that's a, a misinformation cam uh, campaign that's uh, published on the, the Children's Hospital of, of Philadelphia's website. Oh, they don't correct for body weight and they don't correct for ingestion versus injection where the ingested form of aluminum only 0.3 percent of it is actually makes it into the body where the body has to deal with it so for infants and children up to six months we show in the mcfarland et al study in the appendix you could download the appendix um share that out and and when people say you get more aluminum in food and water and everything made from water you have two responses that are really useful. The first response is, oh, my God, I'm so much more concerned about vaccine aluminum now that I know that there's so much aluminum in food and water. Because the, expo the risk due to exposure is cumulative. But in reality, your second response is, no, you're, you're, it depends on your age and your body weight. L you know, infants are not little adults. They have 20% glomerular filtration rate. Um and uh so yeah it's time to get active on the stuff that we know i mean we need to start asking the nih to uh, through our senators and congressmen to start funding safe detox what does that look like medically i don't know scientifically 
Um, things that could be tested include, you know, chronic exposure, everyday exposure to compounds that are known to take the aluminum out of our tissue. That would include things like Fiji water, um, high silica Fiji water, high silica mineral water. It doesn't have to be Fiji water. Um, and as we say in our scientific paper, things like spirulina and chlorella at the same time that you're taking the Fiji water, your child's taking the Fiji water, well, we should have a clinical trial of different protocols. What happens if people that used to vaccinate, if they go on this protocol to get the metal out or go on that protocol and get the metal out? And uh, what is the effect on overall public health? So this plague of aluminum, um, I'm happy to say that Tony and I, we saw eye to eye on it. And I'm very, very sorry that I, um, I won't be working directly with you again, but I'm going to continue our work and I'm going to continue to fight uh, to make sure that the rest of society knows what you knew and knows what we knew. And uh, with that, I'd just like to say I love you, Tony.